Hey, what is up everyone? This is Gary A. Swaby, and you are now watching or listening to the Powercast. And today we will be recapping Power Book 2 Ghost Season 3, Episode 4. And the title of the episode is Land of Opportunity. And I am joined by Mr. Richard Bailey Jr. How are you doing today, Richard? Doing good, Gary. What's up, listeners and viewers? Okay, I see you got an uh, interesting uh, sub name there, uh, Power Book 2 Ghost CI. <laughs> Do you want to explain what that means now or, or Leo? Yeah, I will explain. I'll just say that I am the CI that we have been looking for this entire show. I know that Sack said he is the CI, but uh, I have something else to say about that. But I will reveal my information a little bit later as to why I say I'm the CI. Continue. <laughs> oh wow, there's a lot of CIs in the show. I guess Rich is is the real one. You know? <laughs> but um, yeah, we are also joined by Miss Dana Abercrombie, aka Lorenzo's fingerprint. How are you, Dana? <laughs> I'm doing better than Lorenzo and a fingerprint. So I'm excited to talk about this episode. There were some really good things, a lot of talky things, and a lot of bad things. But like bad in a good way. Like a Michael Jackson bag. Oh, yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, and, you know, as you are a fingerprint, I think you've been leaving yourself in too many places because now Monet's seen you. She done seen you, so. <laughs> she done seen me. I tried to hide and duck and dive and dip, but it just didn't work out. She, She's too quick. She caught me. I'm sorry. I tried, though. I was, I was hiding. Uh, it, it, will, it will be okay, though. I, I, don't, I don't think anything will happen to Lorenzo. I think everything will be fine. So it's all good. <laughs> it's going well for him. But yeah, um, we are back for another episode. Uh, sorry, it's a little late. You know, we had some things going on, crazy schedule. I also had uh, my treatment this week because I, I am receiving a treatment for sickle cell. And, uh, you know, that sometimes that delays things also. Uh, and it's also why I'm not on camera. I'm not fully feeling myself at the moment. But I will be back on camera next week. So don't worry, people. Um, but, yeah, we're going to get into our takeaways in just a, in just a second. Um, and, you know, we're going to there's a lot to discuss in this episode. Um, but just a quick reminder, if you do enjoy the these shows, please do hit the like button. It's very important for our channel's growth. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there who enjoy the content, so please do, you know, hit the like button because it doesn't cost anything. Uh, we could be, you know, charging. Uh, there's there's memberships and all that stuff out there now that I see people doing, but we want to keep this show free for the people. So please do hit the like button just to show, you know, your appreciation and your support. It, it, it helps to go a long way. And then also uh, leave your comments, you know, uh, let us know how you feel about Power Book book 2 Ghost so far. Um, and, you know, also share your thoughts and theories or you can respond to anything that we say on this, this episode also. Uh, and we will reply in the comments too. Um, and then also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and all that good stuff and check out the entertainment channel and also the gaming channel, as we have a lot of other, you know, specific content on those channels. So that is all the house cleaning for this week. So, you know, we're going to get right into our takeaway segment. And this week it is Dana Abercrombie's turn to go first. So hit us with your takeaways, please. I'm going to hit you with my best shot and I'm going to fire away. Boom, Ouch. boom. I'm not with so, um, <laughs> uh, so, um, Land of Opportunity. This was a really great episode in terms of how it showed how people who are different classes, and yes, you can say of different races, how they don't all get the same start. And how, because certain things are not uh, given to you, you would say environment-wise, your parents, how you were raised, that you have to work twice three times, four times as hard as, say, the average Brad and Chad, little Michael. Um, and so this was a really great demonstration. I do this a lot of times in colleges, obviously not now, because, you know, they're trying to ban anything that's like race. Uh, 
But I will say that this was interesting in terms of the growth of the Effie character. It made me really happy and it also made me really sad because to me it seems like when you give so much uh, growth to a character and you give them so much backstory, despite the fact that it was a lot of exposition, I wonder how long they're going to be on the show. I think they want us to sympathize with her. They want us to kind of feel for her. She's not in this because, oh, I love drugs and, and I'm making money and I want to be a pimp and a hustler. This is something that she needs in order to live the American dream or live in the land of opportunity. So I like that. And it also goes hand in hand with Tariq. Remember how we were saying how Tariq is completely different from his father? From what we all saw with the evolution of Ghost, he liked what he was doing. He liked the power. He liked all of the money. There was a side of him that liked living on that dangerous edge. If you kind of similar to the Walter White character in Breaking Bad. Remember, it started out as a need. It started out as security for the family because I have the cancer and I'm dying. And then by the end, he's like, I, I like it. This is this is who I am. And see, with Tariq, and this is why we've had that conversation about him not being his father. I think and it also showed how Ghost, if he was to do that that um what was it oh, oh, oh my gosh what's that word would you call it that uh, exercise that they did in the class I really believe that Tariq would be not Tariq Ghost would be just as behind as where Effie was Tariq was actually around the second or maybe the third line but I strongly believe it was the second line in the front you had the two white guys and then you had Tariq so you see how much farther ahead his father put him as opposed to Effie, who didn't have all those connections, who wasn't born into that environment. So that, again, just goes to show why, how Tariq and Ghost, they're not the same person at all. So I really like that. And I like the fact that we see this kind of friendship and bond with Effie and Tariq. Remember the whole, I want to go to Cali with you. We're, you know, not I want to go to Stanford with you, but I'm going to go and support you and we're going to leave this life behind. That to me was like, oh, this is, you see how much different that he seems to be from his father. But also at the same time, I'm looking at Effie a little sideways because anytime we get attached to a character, remember the innocent, and you can claim that she's the innocent in this one for this season because she does not want to really be a part of this. Remember, she has her security numbers. She wants to go into robotics. That's science. That's expensive. So she needs that money, and she has, she is thinking ahead. So yay for that part. I liked how they really did that so much. Another thing that stood out to me was um, the, the Kane situation where – Kane, you know, I'm big, you never always put me behind, but I'm actually smarter than you. I can move quicker than you. And then we got to the part where the white nationalists are just coming in droves. I thought that that was like the FBI, the way how they just came in like that. Like this was a sting operation. I was confused. But the way how they came in and you would see that Lorenzo is the one who's thinking ahead. We got to we got to go. We got to go. But remember, Kane wanted to stay and be comfortable and count the money. But Lorenzo, because of his experience, he knows that you have to, we got to go. We got to keep it moving because anybody can tell us. They can find out where we're at. And I think that as much as Kane is smart, in a lot of ways, he is still stupid. So, and that just takes growth and experience. And I really think if Lorenzo stops being that, and he explained, I'm trying, I'm trying to be the leader because a man leads, I'm, you know, I'm the father, I'm supposed to lead this family. But if he lets his, not guard down, but if he lets his son take some, and this is another word that they use, burden, because it's not gonna be a burden to him because he wants to learn. So if you really welcome your son into that environment and you really teach him things as opposed to yelling at him and you stay in the back, know your place, they can really be a force of nature. It's just really unfortunate that, uh, you know, he killed Zeke and now uh, Monet knows. 
Um, just a really quick side note here that I just want to point out because it stood out so much that it made me go, yay, Monet, she became two-dimensional instead of one-dimensional. So remember when they took her to the to the mural site? And she's like, mm, I don't know, what are you doing? No, I was stupid, right? And then she took off the blindfold and she turned into this happy person. We have not seen a happy Monet since, I'm not even gonna say season one. I have never seen a happy Monet before, but she was happy, she was smiling, she was, yay. Yeah, like I was ready for her to pull out the phones and the cameras, have a photo shoot right by the, the wall where Zeke's name was. So we know what Mary is capable of. I just want the directors to pull it out of her some more because I need more than just one dimension. So yay for that, Mary, baby steps, but we're getting there. We got a smile. So um, another thing that really stood out to me, again, going with the lesson because today led the land of opportunity. It's also about seizing your opportunity as opposed to the opportunities that you're already born into. Sometimes you got to fight. So, what was really interesting was the Diane, Diana aspect. Remember how everybody was writing what they want on, onto the cards? So for the cards we had was Diana wanted independence, Effie wanted freedom, and Tariq wanted family. That has always been the theme I felt since season one. We're learning a bit more about that. We're seeing, we saw suffocation with Diana since season one, but she's really kind of trying to put her foot down and her family ain't dog poop. And I am so sorry what that girl is going through because the fact that Lorenzo would come to her and then try to guilt her and then Monet tried to guilt her, that is some deep psychological mess. That is called monster mommy syndrome where your parents, they treat you like dog poop, do whatever that they were supposed to do. And then you come running back to them because that's kind of the way that it's programmed. At the end of the day, you love and respect your parents. So you trying to even break free is causing guilt and turmoil within yourself, which we've seen with Diana in this um, episode because she wants that freedom. She wants to be her own person. And yet when her parents come with the BS, you gotta do this, you gotta be, and not even just ask, because before it was, you know, I hate to ask. I love you so much, Diana. You're my favorite daughter. Now it was like, oh, oh, you think you're too good because you got up here for the college? Oh, you think you're too good, but remember, I'm the one who's paying for you? That is some deep-seated, I see what I can't say what I want to say because, you know, the YouTubes will come and start striking. But you know what it is that I'm trying to say. But that is some deep-seated BS right there. That is some some narcissistic psychological damage that y'all are doing to that to that child. And as much as I don't like Asalasalikum Salim, he had a point. You're gonna have to start breaking away from that family. And maybe what she's doing, because this is a big thing that she did, she can use this as leverage to find her freedom at last. Cause I'm praying for her. But the point that I did want to make involving Diana was the struggle of finding her own independence and always being burdened by her family. And I think I hope that the fact that she was the one who set up Waltman, Whitman, sorry, who set up Whitman and that she knows the family secrets, that she can hold it. This is her time and her to turn to hold it against her family so that they can do something for her. And for her would be, leave me alone. Don't involve me in your stuff. Don't come for me. Don't call me. Just let me be. And don't have so much anger and animosity about me just wanting to be a normal person, be a normal kid. This is not the life that she asked for. She didn't sign up excuse me, for this. Tariq, you can argue, signs up for this. You never teach me anything, Dad. I want to do that. So he signs up for this. Meanwhile, Diana never did. So I really hope that this is her way of being able to break away. Just how she lied to Whitman, that she can whip up some lies too and, and get her family to get off of her case because she, she needs to be able to break free because they're toxic. And she wasn't lying when she said, the cancer is in Monet and we got to cut the cancer out. That thing came from the gut. Yes, it was to set him up, but that was some guttural stuff that she said. She needs therapy too. Get some therapy. Black people, go to therapy. Um, 
I think that was three. I'm not sure if that was three, but if I can slip in one more um, really quickly, Drew got to die. He's too distracted. He's getting distracted. He wants to bang the cousin, the play cousin, the play cousin. Now, I know they're not blood related, but the fact that y'all had to keep saying we're not blood related, that's just, he a hoe. Ain't nothing wrong with hoeing. I'm not hoe shaming. But what I am saying is he is becoming so distracted that he claims that he wants to be there or do things. And granted, he did save everybody at the end. But that's not the point. The point is, if Lorenzo would have never made that phone call to him, I think that he, they would have all still been dead because he is too distracted. And all these different means that he is chasing, the grinder and the Twitter and the Instagram and the every other thing that he's just chasing is not cute. Also, STDs. I hope he stays protected. But that should be everything. So that's what all I have to say so far. Wow. That Dana was in red form today. <laughs> Those were some some that was a hilarious uh takeaway segment right there. I, I don't know if you've been watching some comedy at the Apollo or something, the Apollo Theater, but wow, that that was those were some great takes. Uh and I, I like what you said about Diana too, because um, I do agree that that family is like mentally manipulating Diana. Like, you know, he, like from Lorenzo to Monet, like everyone just kind of walks over her and kind of controls her and tells her what to do and stuff. And I believe that this is going to um, cause some psychological impact on her. And she might end up being the coldest one of them one day. You know, she might mm -hmm. transform and become the coldest one in the family. But uh, what she you becomes, say? she becomes. Remember that when we were watching Kanan, um jukebox. She becomes. She's going to be the jukebox of this family. You watch it. The way how she's being treated, she's going to be the jukebox. Also, I don't know what kind of voodoo Monet is doing, but it seemed like the same voodoo that Jada Pinkett Smith, Smith allegedly did on, on Will Smith. Can you just notice how much control she has over certain situations? Uh, she was, <laughs> remember, she was happy and smiling when she saw the mural, the um, mural, right? And then all of a sudden, Diana came and she's like, <clears throat> right? That reminded me of that Chris Rock joke when she was just looking over and <clears throat> her eyes on the back of her head. I don't know if that's hate. It feels like hate. You could say that that may be because of her relationship with, with um, Lorenzo, but no, I think that's some kind of deep-seated hate in general that she has for that child. So I'm afraid for her. It ain't right. Yeah, indeed. Um, but yeah, excellent takeaways, great takes there. Uh, there's a lot to unpack, and we will unpack that later on in the question segment. But yeah, excellent takeaways. I'm sure the people are going to have a lot to say about uh, what, what you just said, you know, with the takeaways. But let's hear from Mr. Richard Bailey Jr. now. So, Rich, hit us with your takeaways. Okay, first and foremost, uh, excellent takeaways, Dana, as always. Very entertaining. Um, so let me start off by saying I actually really enjoyed this episode of uh, Power. Um, I thought some stuff was pretty comical. It was very entertaining, though. Very entertaining, very action-packed. So I, I think uh, they're definitely on the right track. But uh, I have about three different takeaways I want to get into here today. Um, and I'm going to save the stuff that happened with the Tejada family and Tariq for a little bit later. But uh, the three takeaways. Let's start off with what happened with Sax and Jenny in this episode. So uh, we did see that uh, a lot of scenes where, you know, Sax is meeting up with Jenny and she's getting all these phone calls. Uh, we did see that she was getting a call from Lauren at the time, but we did see uh, uh, that Sax took a photo of her receiving that call from the number. Now, he doesn't know right now that that's Lauren, so I assume he's going to find out when he finds out that information. Uh, I'll be very curious to see how he reacts. But uh yeah, they have their back and forth because he's getting information from her. Obviously, he got the redacted files about uh, Theo Rollins. So they're still working together, but obviously keeping secrets from each other. And then later in this episode, she finally lets him know she's been working with Blanca. And of course, they have that uncomfortable reunion with the two characters. And we, we know about all their history with the original Power series and how they dislike each other. So I'm very curious to see how this little alliance works. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some issues 
Um, so let's see where they go with that. And then, of course, finally, we do see Lauren again in this episode when Jenny goes back to finally talk to her because she keeps calling her countless times while she's uh, having these conversations with Sax. And she basically tells her a little bit of information about the fact that she did see Monet visiting the school and hanging out with Tariq and that Tariq kind of looked, it looked like Tariq was taking orders from Monet. And she also mentions that she saw Diana on the rooftop, because if you if you saw the last season of Power, you know that rooftop of Stansfield, that's where they were stashing some some, some of the, the product that. So Jenny does say she's going to get people to try to check out that area. So I assume that that probably will be what happens next week. You know, we have to wait and see. But obviously, now they know Diana is the person of interest. They know about the rooftop. So uh, I'm very curious to see what happens next, because with all that information, they're definitely going to do some more digging. So stay tuned for that. So that pretty much is the Sax and Jenny wrap up. Let's go now to Tariq, Effie, and Brayden in this episode. Uh, we do see when the episode starts, business is booming. You know, we saw my boy Tariq finally got a car. I know Gary was very surprised when he saw that, you know, and that car, and obviously I'm, I, I, blue is my favorite color. So I, you know, I thought that car was looking really sharp. That Porsche, that Porsche looked really nice. So uh, props. Finally, he got a car. Um, we, uh, of course, we do see that uh, we got an answer as to what happened last week when, you know, when Kane decided to call, to call Effie. Uh, and we found out that Effie never returned his phone call and she basically, he, we do find out from their conversation that Kane does know he already figured out, like Dana predicted last week, he already knew that uh, she had something to do with Lauren getting killed, supposedly. Nobody knows that Lauren is still alive yet, aside from Jenny. But he figured that out, and he decides that he said, hey, so you let me know when you tell Tariq. Now, obviously, stuff happens in this episode with Kane and Lorenzo, which I think a lot of this stuff causes him to really look at things differently. So... He doesn't. So so basically, Effie does tell him later in this episode that she, she she doesn't feel right telling Tariq. She can't tell Tariq and she hopes that he will honor the wishes and not tell Tariq. So he he agrees with Effie for now, not to say anything to Tariq. We'll see if that changes later, obviously, um, because, again, Effie, this entire episode. And I, I really like all the stuff that Dana said about Effie and how they really, you know, reveal more about the character in this episode, because she had multiple opportunities to tell Tariq the truth about Lauren and she could not do it. Now, this means Tariq is going to be really pissed when he finds out eventually, whether it's the next episode or in the next couple of episodes. So stay tuned for that because I can't wait to see what happens. Uh, as for other stuff that happened with Tariq in this episode, we did have the whole situation where he had to help get RSJ back on board with working with Weston Holdings. And I have to say this, the black Elon Musk joke I thought was hilarious, you know, when, uh, you know, uh, Lucas tried to make that comparison. And, you know, I'm glad that Tariq put him in his place as well as RSJ. But I do want to say I really like how they incorporated the whole QPC building into the storyline. Because, again, from the original power, this is when property that James A. Patrick had got access to, um, all the stuff he was doing in the past. So I like how they incorporated that. And, you know, they talk about Tariq's estate. So basically, they're giving you a sense of, yes, we want you to remember uh, why Tariq is doing all this stuff. He's trying to get access to that money in the future. But uh, I just like how they're trying to build the relationship between RSJ and Tariq. So I look forward to seeing where that goes in future episodes. So I give them props on that. And then finally, let's get into the juicy stuff of this episode, all right? Obviously, uh, Lorenzo, the episode starts with uh, Lorenzo bringing the family to show Monet the mural of uh, Zeke, which I thought was was pretty cool. Basically trying to get in the good graces. But, you know, because Lorenzo was doing something nice for the family, you had to know the way this episode ends with the revelation that, yes, his fingerprints were on that the weapon that killed Zeke. That's just the perfect way to start and end the episode because, you know, the character is uh, on borrowed time. But pretty much, uh, Monet does have the conversation with the family. And, and as Dana alluded to earlier, Diana obviously always felt like an outcast because the family did not want to have anything to do with her. And we saw that at the beginning of this episode also, because when the family decides to go meet and talk about how they're going to deal with this Kevin Whitman problem, 
Monet tells her, no, I, I need you to go to go away. Just go back to school. That's what you want to do anyway, right? And then later on in this episode, you do see Lorenzo coming to Diana as well as uh, Monet coming to Diana, all because they need something done. So, yeah, it does. I think they did a very good job of really highlighting the land of opportunity theme and then Diana wanting to basically become free of all of this. So that, that was very well done. I have to give them props on that. Um, we also do see that, again, they have this whole thing with uh, now with, with Mecca's other side of the business of, of having to sell these guns. And the white nationalists that Dana had mentioned earlier. Now, I, I do want to make a comment about that. Because it is revealed in this episode that the leader of that group is actually a CI for Blanca. So to go to what Gary mentioned earlier when he asked, why am I the CI of this particular episode? Well, it's because I have determined that in order to be a CI on power, all you have to do is take photographs of illegal activity that people are doing and, you know, watch what they're doing very closely. That's it. You know, we have been covering this power show, taking notes and maybe even photographs of every episode. So, yeah, I think I am a CI at this point. So I would I, I would be a perfect candidate to be a CI on a future power episode. We'll see if that happens. But pretty much I did find it interesting how that guy was a CI. And of course, when they have the shootout, which, I, again, I thought the shootout was was excellent. When they had that shootout, however, a very sloppily done of them not to take out the leader of the group. You know, we saw Drew shoot him and then the guy gets away. So obviously that's not good. And those guys will come back and retaliate. You know, that CI guy, he will come back. And of course, they did mention in this episode, he's in critical condition right now. But this is power. OK, we know there's going to be some type of retaliation that happens because he's not dead. He's in critical condition. He's not dead yet. So let's see what happens. But uh, we do see, uh, you know, Gordo. That's the cousin uh, of the, you know, Castillo's uh, son, Gordo and uh, Drew, getting close together. We knew that was going to happen. And obviously, uh, I do want to say, though, and this is something that I didn't notice because Gary and I did, we covered Snowfall the other day. I don't understand what it is with these shows where you know that there's an illegal deal happening and then you decide to have someone there that the other person doesn't recognize. Because this happened again when Braden was the person that they brought there but of course they decided let's not have gordo who this this guy actually knows let's not have him a part of this deal so it looks very suspicious right that's common sense so um i thought it was very interesting how they could pull that off and think that they wouldn't that nothing wouldn't happen but obviously brayden is definitely in trouble now because they got a picture of him they got a picture of his car so uh there's gonna be a lot of things that happen now as a result and when they start doing their digging to find out who he is because obviously Blanca already knows who he is as well as Jenny. So this does not look good for everybody involved. Um, so stay tuned for that. And finally, uh, we have to take a moment of silence to uh, give our props to Kevin Whitman. This is Gary's favorite character, not mine's. I, I wanna make that very clear. Um. I predicted, well, I predicted on this show last week, this character is gonna get killed this season. Now I didn't know he was gonna get killed this soon, but I saw because he was so obsessed he had to get taken out like Greg Knox had to get taken out. So rest in peace to Kevin Whitman. Uh, but I will say, Monet, that was a very foolish decision to kill him right in front of Diana, because Diana, obviously, she can say that she's an accessory because she was involved. But she did not know that he was going to get killed. As she said, he's going to get he's going to he's going to get arrested, whatever. But then Monet decides to kill him. So this is bad for Monet moving forward because Diana knows all about her family secrets. So I would not be surprised if she does find a way to get Monet in trouble with this later on. So stay tuned for that. But again, I am rooting for Diana to get free of her family. So I don't mind seeing more family drama in the process. But uh, overall, fantastic episode of Power. Definitely looking forward to seeing what happens next week. So uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Excellent takeaways as always. Great observations. Uh, ju just one mistake there, because Whitman is definitely not my favorite character. Um, <laughs> I believe that was yeah. yours. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad he's gone. He's, he's very obsessed with uh, Monet. This very uh, creepy obs uh, obsession. So uh, yeah, he's gone. So let's see what happens next.
Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Um, and you know, I, I if uh if if uh, RSJ is the black Elon Musk, I th I think it's about time we we reach out to him and get verified or something, man. Because I don't want to pay to get verified <laughs> on Twitter. So we need to hit up RSJ. <laughs> I agree. That, that's a very good point. I agree. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, great points overall. Uh, you mentioned some stuff actually that I have in my takeaways as well. But um, but yeah, great great uh, perspective on that, and uh, we will discuss some of that stuff a bit more later on. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get into my takeaways, and then we can get to our discussion. Uh, so first of all, you know, Whitman is dead. We we all saw what happened. You know, Richard just broke it down. You know. Uh, Diana witnessed the murder. She didn't know what was going to happen and everything. She thought they were just setting him up to get busted by the cops. But then Monet, you know, she's she's kind of had this intense rivalry back and forth with women. So she just decided she wanted to end it. And I am curious to see how that's going to go for her in the next episode. Like, because surely they're going to have a bit more questions about what took place, you know, and she's going to have to give some 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 form of like formal statement or something I'm, I'm guessing like so yeah i i don't think they're just gonna let this slide the fact that she killed whitman in her house even if even if they do have that the proof that he was harassing her or whatever i feel like you know this is going to be a stain on uh monet and yeah the fact that diana was there too you know she she better hope that their relationship stays solid, you know, in, in the family, um, Diana and everything, because Diana could talk also if, if things get bad enough. So, um, yeah, that was a poor decision. But, you know, Whitman is gone, so we're, we're not going to have him stalking Monet anymore. But I do believe that uh, the investigations team is closing in on everyone. Um, especially after the events of this episode, because, you know, we see what happened with the whole CI thing. So this white guy, you know, a uh, gun, gun dude, this gun customer or whatever, he is actually a CI. And, um, you know, now, now they're going to be onto them. Like, cause we saw that the guy took a picture and I agree, Rich, um, they should have had the other dude. They should have had Gordo there as well. Like they could have had both Gordo and Braden, you know, if they wanted to. I get the logic of, oh, if this is a white guy, he's a white supremacist, so we're gonna have a white guy on, on our side. I get the logic there, but they should have still had Gordo because that's who the guy knows, you know? And, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that's good logic to have, you know, the whole, oh, he's white, so I'm sending a white guy. It's not, it's not great logic to have, but I understand why they thought that would be a good idea, even though it wasn't a good idea. But um, but yeah, like I feel like this is going to, you know, it, this is gonna um have the investigation team closer on their trail now, especially the fact that Braden has that picture, and Braden has a criminal history now already. So, you know, this is gonna be um something bad, you know. And then uh, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Let me see. Uh, uh, there was something additional I forgot, but yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. It will come back to me, but yeah, like I, I, I just felt like that, um, the Rico is like going to get a hell of a lot. Oh yeah, that was it. So the Lauren thing, right? So, uh, Richard already kind of discussed this, but the fact that Lauren gave up details about the, um, the rooftop and everything. Yeah. Like it's going to get like, I, I could see perhaps you know either diana or effie maybe being taken in for question because I, I i believe they're gonna find them you know using that because we know course correct is live now you know that they've been using it we saw at the start of the episode effie was like kind of you know she was seeing all the sales come in and then she even had to kind of um she had to kind of school the worker who was cutting everything up wrong so it seems like that business is booming right now so I feel like there's probably going to be, um, you know, a situation where they find out about that rooftop and about Effie, you know, planting the drugs there and stuff. And then um, they're going to take them in for question. And, and, you know, this whole Rico case is about 
um, making sure everyone is seen to be doing criminal things. You know, everyone has to be involved in the conspiracy. So it looks like, you know, just by watching, we're seeing that they're, they're implicating all of the different players in different situations. So like, you know, they have Monet, they have Tariq, they have Brayden in the picture now. And, you know, it's only a matter of time before they get Diana and Effie too. It's like everyone's going to have some sort of dirt that, that the investigation team is going to be privy to. And they're just going to be able to tie it all together, you know. So, yeah, it's it's it's, it's looking a bit rocky, and and you know, they uh, Monet took out Whitman, but they can't kill every cop that they come come across. You know, that's not an option. They can't kill every cop. So, what are they going to do to, you know, loosen up that that tightrope? Because you know, they are really like that. They, they they have something big has to happen to kind of cut them loose from from all of this pressure that's coming from uh, the investigation and you know now Tariq he kind of knows it is a bit more serious after his conversation with Tate because we see Tate is now extorting him low-key because he kind of uh, revealed to him that you know he's been in contact with Blanca and um, so I don't know if this is going to be a regular thing now where Tariq checks in with Tate, you know, after donating to him to see what they know, maybe, you know, maybe some details will be leaked to him and he'll be able to stay one step ahead of what the investigation team are doing. Um, you know, so maybe that's how they can loosen up some of this pressure. And I do believe that eventually he is gonna know about Lauren, like he might actually end up being the first one to find out. So yeah, we'll have to see how they play it, but I do like how they've how they've set up this whole investigation story because in in this show, like Power, uh, the the police investigation is always a big part of it. But I feel like for the past few seasons, it's kind of been lacking a little bit. Like it hasn't been as interesting, and it just kind of seems like they're hitting a brick wall all the time. Like they're not really doing anything, but. In this season, they've kind of made it interesting again to follow. Um, so I like that. And my second takeaway. Um, so yeah, I li like Rich, I enjoyed the callback to the, the Queen's Child Project, the QCP. And we see that, you know, Tariq is really kind of stepping up in his kind of business role. Because that's one thing Ghost had, his father, you know, his father had that, that duality where he was like a street kingpin and also a successful nightclub owner. And then he later kind of got into politics a little bit. Um, and we're starting to see that same duality in Tariq now. But I think Tariq is going to do a much better job than, than Ghost, you know. Um, and he's showing that he has the business acumen so far, um, you know, being able to use his, his assets, his estate as leverage to secure that deal with RSJ. And I like how they also kind of tied it in with that classroom scene, because that was kind of like a setup to this. It was like a precursor um, where, you know, they showed they showed that he he kind of did have a head start that others didn't have. Like I like the fact that they visually showed that, you know, um, that some people don't actually get that that same opportunity and, that, and access to the same things that he has. And I think that's very important for people in society to understand because, you know, sometimes I hear a lot of talk um, relating to, you know, minorities and people from uh, disenfranchised communities. Like I hear a lot of people say, oh, if you like, if you just work hard, you can be successful too, like, like these other people. But that's not always true. Like, cause those other people had a head start. They had access to funds and assets and stuff that, those people in the disenfranchised communities didn't have. And we see that, you know, with the contrast between Tariq and Effie, you know, Effie is really, you know, she's right at the back in that line, in that scene, you know, and she didn't have access to all that stuff. And that kind of shows more of her motivations and why she, she hustles so hard and why she's so willing to, you know, to achieve 
and aim high with what they're doing and stuff because she has to she she doesn't have anything else she doesn't have a backup so i like that they visually showed that in that scene i, I thought that was a great scene and then you know later on we see Tariq kind of bounce back with the rsj deal and he uses what he has you know his estate you know and secures that deal so i thought that was set up really well and i like that they showed it and then also you know Tariq, as uh, Richard mentioned, he's got a new car now. Um, he, he needs to be careful, though. You know, that is a nice ride, but he needs to be careful because he's starting to get like Frank Lucas now. You know, you know the, the, the mistake Frank Lucas made by showing off, you know, getting fly and showing off his wealth. So he needs to be careful because, you know, who buys a Porsche? You know, what student buys a Porsche as their first car? Like, <laughs> you know, he bought like the most flashiest car and everything so yeah like he, he needs to be careful with that one but um yeah that was that's funny he finally has his car i know that's something we've been talking about for a long time um but my final takeaway is um so yeah like we see kane has in the past episode or two we've seen kane kind of play that card that he has against his dad where you know he knows that he is the one that killed Zeke. So we we saw him have his little power trip and everything and kind of, you know, uh, make make Lorenzo be his lackey and kind of um validate him and everything in the family situations. But now, you know, after uh Lorenzo saved him, he stepped in and literally saved his life and everything. And um, you know, as you guys said, he was. He was um, telling him that it's a bad idea to count the money there and everything like that, you know. Um, so I think Kane is now starting to finally feel closer to his father. Like he's he's starting he's starting to understand that that bond and that, that the fact that Lorenzo does genuinely care about him, even if he is hard on him and even if he doesn't let him have his way all the time. He's kind of, you know, seeing that his father does actually have his best interests at heart. And uh, now he's feeling closer to him. But the problem is that it's, it's all too late, you know, because although Cain did say he, he, he told his father, You're, the secret is safe with me. I'm not going to tell anyone. Well, it's way too late now. <laughs> it doesn't matter now because that secret is about to come out, you know? <laughs> so uh, Monet's got that file. She got the file, the paperwork that um, shows Lorenzo's fingerprints and everything. And she's gonna be onto him now. So that, that secret is about to come out. And I truly believe that time might be up for Lorenzo soon. So, you know, I, I wonder how that is gonna affect Kane now once that happens, because um, if if Lorenzo does get taken out in the next episode or the next few episodes or whatever, you know, I do think it's going to hit both Kane and Diana very hard. Um, even though Lorenzo's kind of like taking advantage of Diana a little bit, because, uh, you know, we, we saw that um, he went to pick up the money and everything and then he dropped more drugs on her, you know, like he's kind of just using her at, at this at this point. But I do think Diana feels closer to him than she does Monet. So if she were to lose him, um, that would, you know, I think that would have a big impact on her. That would change her to where she might be at deeper odds with Monet if, if Lorenzo's gone. Um, and Kane, I think he will be very affected if Lorenzo's gone. He, he probably doesn't even understand how much he's going to be affected. Um, and he's going to, you know, fill this void and he's going to have this like strong because we, we know that Kane wants to be number one. We that that's clear. He wants to be in control. But that's while his dad is alive. So when his dad is gone um, and especially after what just happened with them getting closer, I feel like he might feel some sort of. Um, some sort of self doubt a little bit that he won't be able to live up to his father, even though he doesn't, you know, feel that now because he feels like he's in charge already. But when his father is actually gone, I think he's going to start to think about how his father did 
provide him uh, provide for him in the past and and give him some some form of structure and advice and he's going to remember all the times that his dad did kind of co-sign him even though he had leverage against him like i think it's going to hit him hard and he's going to start self-doubting himself because of it subconsciously so you know i wonder how that will affect him and there's talk that kane is really like the number one guy in the streets anyway so i wonder how what effect that lorenzo's death will have on kane um because the way things are going like this could this could end up affecting everyone if he somehow changes you know um we see that he's also kind of getting closer to effie he he kind of admires her a little bit he might be trying to like steal her away um so this could you know based on how lorenzo's death would affect kane it could have big implications on Tariq and the other characters so um i can't wait to see what happens with that uh, later on but yeah those are my takeaways uh I agree with Rich. This was a good episode. Um, I actually really enjoyed it. I know usually I'm very critical of this show, but I actually enjoyed this one. I thought, you know, they did a good job of uh, building building things up. Um, it felt like it was going somewhere. It didn't feel like things just conveniently happened. Like it felt like, you know, they were actually making connections in the scenes and everything. So yeah, I, I give them their props on this one. But uh, those are my takeaways. Uh, I think Dana had something to say, so go ahead, Dana. I just wanted to really quickly add something, which was the fact that this episode, the way how they layered the racism within this was brilliantly done. When we see, um, what is his name? RSTV? RSV? RSJ. <laughs> RSJ. With RSJ is sitting at that table and how they went and they was like, oh, you're the black Elon Musk. And he was like, his daddy gave him the money from the apartheid. Um, that thing is really interesting because when he's sitting there at the table, even though he is, you could say he's better than them in terms of money, in terms of class and everything else, because remember, he's a billionaire. These people, they have money, not to say that they broke, but I'm just saying this is a world renowned, well-class billionaire, black man and how they went and they think, oh, because you've made it to our level and you superseded our level, that's only because your parents must have given it to you. Notice how they didn't say you worked hard and busted real hard on your own. Remember, he had to tell them, you know, there were days when we didn't have no food. We didn't have this. I wish my, my parents gave me, um, what was it, a trust fund. Don't waste yours, Tariq. So it showed how black people are not a monolith. And even when we do make it, people think that we couldn't do it on our own accord, that we had to have family help us, money already established for us in order for us to not just get where they're at, but to supersede them. So I thought that was brilliantly done. And just as that, then also to show us how majority, not to say white people aren't only, and other, other races aren't, but to say the majority of minorities, they also have, they're all the way at the back of the start line. They're here at the start line, they're back behind the start line. How much more further they have to go ahead of say the Brads and the Chads of the world. So I really liked how they handled race in this episode to show you one, black people are not a monolith, our stories, we are the same, but we are not the same. And how just because how you end up does not dictate your future. So I just really wanted to say that in there because I would end up forgetting. So kudos to that as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was very layered with that, you know, that that whole message. So I liked that. I liked how they they navigated that uh in this episode. But um yeah, so great takeaway segment. Uh, there's lots to discuss, so let's get right to that. Uh, please do, you know, people comment, hit the like button, subscribe, all that good stuff um, if you are enjoying the episode. But yeah, let's get right to uh, the questions and discussions. So the first thing I wanted to ask you guys is, um, hmm, 
Hmm, should we start there? Yeah, let's start there. So it, do you think at this moment, I mean, we've, we've all kind of discussed it a little bit in our takeaways, but let's have a bit of a back and forth here. Um, is is Diana going to stay loyal to Monet, do you think? Um, you know, she she saw what she was doing. Like, there were, um, she sent her actually to go and talk to Whitman ahead of time um, to kind of like say, oh, she's making me lie to you and all these things. Um, so, yeah, but like, can we really, can, can Monet really uh, trust Diana? And um, if Diana does rebel against her, who is to blame for that? Like, is, is Monet to, to blame for that? Or, you know, what do you think it is? So, yeah, it's, it's a very laid question, but basically, is Diana going to stay loyal to Monet? Mm -hmm. So that is the question. So, um, Dana, I will go to you first. What do you think about that? Okay, yay. I will say this. If you want there to be character growth, if you want there to be any form of tension, she will have to pull away from that family. From a writer's perspective, if you're going to just keep this child, I wish, I hope, I dream, I hope maybe one day, huh? and you don't have her act upon that, then why am I watching this character? Every character I see, want, I want them to have some type of growth, some kind of, this right now she's at the revelation point. If she does not act upon that, what is the point of her character still being there? Because it just shows, as if you lack backbone, you just saying words to me, you really don't want to go. And even if she doesn't want to go, but she makes herself, pushes herself away from her family, that right there is some form of growth. So for me, as entertainment-wise, because I still want my dinner scene, she has to grow and she has to be that threat to Monet. Remember the whole Oedipus theory of marry what has to go, marry your mother, kill your father. But then this one, it'll be kill your mother, marry your father, not literally, just in terms of taking place and to become a leader of the family and the leader of your own life. Remember, Monet is the cancer. She said that from her gut. And if Monet is the cancer, and you have you are right now, you with the scalpel who can cut her out. I don't mean kill. You don't have to kill, but you have to separate. Do that biopsy. So biopsy yourself from Monet. And in order to do that, she has to act. It just can't be a, oh, I wish, I wish. Or else then, you know, nothing is going to happen from this. And then what is the point of me even watching you? So I'm going to go with yes. It's not going to be easy because I think that it might split the family apart. If you're looking at the family, the whole family sucks. They're grimy. They're terrible. But they have their own little qualities, except for Monet. Um, but in order to, you see the family is kind of fracturing and doing its own thing a little bit right now. And we see that now with, with whole, the whole revelation of Lorenzo and Monet. I think that in order for it to, for everyone to fully form, discover and who they're going to become, Diana could be the catalyst of that. So the shortest answer to my very long speech is yes. Interesting. Yeah, I do think there's probably going to come a time where the family is a little bit split up. Like, you know, they, they kind of split apart. Uh, I, I feel like it has to happen just the way things are naturally developing. Um, and if Lorenzo were to kind of be taken out, then, you know, you know, I think that would send a ripple through the whole thing. So, yeah. Um, and I do think that Diana is, she's on a path to kind of come more into herself and grow, like you mentioned. And also she has uh, Celine in her ear and he's already kind of telling her, you know, to, to kind of not let yourself be controlled by them and, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> but go but ahead, Dana. Another thing really quickly, if Lorenzo mm -hmm. dies, I think that's a wrap for Diana. Mentally, everything else, that's a wrap. Cause she 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 would be far from done. That's when I'm getting on the bus by myself with my two cents, and I'm going to another state, and I'm not telling you anything. I'm escaping in the dark of the night. I think that she would be done. I think it would be if Lorenzo is killed by Monet, 
it would be a no turning back situation just because of how close she is to Lorenzo. Even though Lorenzo ain't dog poop even though for guilting her into those drug things. But again, that goes that whole monster mom the whole monster mother thing is we wanna obey our parents so much that we will constantly take the abuse just in hopes that they'll see how much we love them. So but I think once that happens, if he is killed by Monet's hand, that she killed the only you would say that she looks up to him kind of like an idol. You know, you grow up looking towards your parents as idol figures. And he's dead, that's it. That's a wrap. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like your dad's like meant to be your superhero. So yeah, if 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 he if he's gone and if she knows that it's Monet as well, yeah, that's that's gonna be crazy. And then, you know, Monet might say the whole Zeke thing happened where he killed Zeke, but then you know, he, they could make the argument that you lied about Zeke for years. So you kind of like caused this whole thing. So yeah. But Rich, what do you think about Diana? You know, is she gonna stay loyal to Monet and the family? Or like, you know, will could we see her kind of take a dark turn later on and become more self-independent and stuff? Well, let me start by saying uh I think it was a very good idea, Gary, for you to go to Dana first, because her name that is the answer to all of this. Lorenzo's fingerprints. Monet knows that he had something to do with Zeke <laughs> getting killed. So to answer the question, I agree with everything that Dana said 100%. I, I feel like if Diana finds out that Monet kills Lorenzo, the game is over. And I do I do find it interesting how uh, Salim is the one that got into her ear telling her you need to separate yourself from the family. Because I kind of feel like that character also could be on borrowed time as well. Because you already know that with Monet, she likes to play, she, 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 she doesn't play no games. So if Diana was to retaliate and somehow make her look guilty in the fact that she, because we all, we, all we all can make the guess that she probably is going to kill Lorenzo unless someone else does it. Uh, but I'm just saying, if she does end up taking out Lorenzo, um, and obviously Diana wants her to pay for that. She's going to do everything in her power to make sure that she, obviously she will, number one, she will separate herself from the family, but she's also going to make sure that Monet pays for that. So that's why I say I can see a situation of them going back and forth tit for tat. And if that is the case, then Celine probably going to get killed as well. I mean, I think it's, I think we can come to that conclusion, but we have to see how the storyline plays out. We also know, as I mentioned uh, on the show before, that Kane kind of knows that uh, this character is a little suspicious. So Kane could also be the one to, to, to take him out as well. I, I, it all depends how the storyline plays out. Because I can see, you know, Diana going to Kane to try to talk to Kane once she finds out something happens to Lorenzo. And then Kane, you know, Kane is still going to be conflicted also because you saw in this episode, he grew closer to Lorenzo, as you already said, Gary. So I, this is why this is a, very good writing standpoint. It's a good opportunity for them to progress the story because there's a lot of complex things happening with the characters. Um, and I do agree with what Dana said, though. Uh, Diana has to, has to separate herself from the family. It's just a matter of how it's going to all go down. Because again, she was there to witness Kevin Whitman getting killed. So uh, I don't know how did all of this plays out in terms of the storytelling, but I'm looking forward to seeing how it plays out because. Um, this whole thing with the mother and daughter, you know, she helped out her mom. Everything is cool. We already know as viewers, everything is not cool between those two. There's a lot of unresolved issues. Now that Kevin Whitman is out of the picture, they can get to what's happening with these two characters. So uh, let's see what happens. But to answer your question, Gary, no, she, she's not going to be loyal to uh, Monet. And she especially won't be loyal if Monet kills Lorenzo, which I think we all believe is going to happen very soon. <laughs> yeah, agreed. And uh, you, what are you gonna say something, Dana? I just wanted to say really quickly: Why are we killing, killing Celine? Like, I'm all for murder, but why are we <laughs> killing Celine exactly? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, he's. I, mean, I still say he's the CI. I have another theory about CI. There's a bunch of CIs all up in the show, which is a good name for you. Um, but at this moment. <laughs> 
Now, now we all know about the innocent situation, but I don't know if they're still keeping up with the innocent has to die, or at least maybe this time you'll stay dead, Lauren, please. Um, I think that Celine could be that encouragement that Diana needs. Mm -hmm. We all need that little push. And Diana, I feel by herself, she would have never even gotten to where she is today. Not in, in terms of thinking about um, crossing the mother and, and breaking, remember she wrote the freedom and he's really feeding her ideas of you know getting free and maybe you have to just break away. Nothing negative in terms of you have to go and kill your mother and, and everything else, but just positive things to say, hey, I support you. Granted, it might also be because he wants the draws, which we also saw with the whole situation of them in the bed, and she was the one saying no, and he's all like, but your booby. So that's another thing that I don't like about him. But he has not done anything negative. He technically has been supportive. I just don't know if it's for a motive, the draws, or because he genuinely cares. Also, he's really older. I'm not sure how old, but he's much older than her. Um, so I don't like him, but I don't see death to death. And I love, you know, you got to kill somebody. Well, but I don't think him. Well, I agree. And I... And the reason why I believe that the character is on borrowed time is because there is one thing that we didn't really address. And we've already mentioned that Diana is obviously selling products at the job, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I do think eventually he's going to find out about this and he's going to question her about this. He'll probably say, whoa, I thought you were different from your family. You're just like your family. At that point, something has to happen to the character. If, if, if he finds out about this stuff, and then it might be a, a, bit, of a bit of a problem. So I, I don't know how they're going to deal with that situation because he is going to find out eventually, though. I think that's that's coming at some point. Uh, I just don't know how they're going to deal with that situation when it happens. That, that is true. And then he came up again for more selling because we yeah. didn't see the first sell-off. But we, we, we do know that there's a second package. Mm -hmm. So he mm -hmm. could find it. And that's how he does get nosy. Um, yeah, I can see that. I can see that, but yeah, I could see that. Because Celine, I believe, is the way how he popped off at her during in the, the previous episode, just out of the blue, oh, I Googled your parents, you ain't all poop, was so opposite of how he's acting now with, you know, you're not your parents, you can break away, you can be free. Mm -hmm. I don't know where he stands. And I don't know if that's because he has a motive or maybe that's the writing. Like they haven't figured his character out yet. Or maybe because he's just being sneaky and he could also be a CI and he's trying to do entrapment. I'm not sure. But now um, I, now the fact that you said that, he can die. Well, I'm, I'm going to make a prediction here. Uh, this is not uh -huh. really a spoiler because we haven't seen any other episodes yet. There's an episode coming out, I believe, episode six called Land of Lies, right? So that's the episode where I think a lot of stuff is going to get revealed. So maybe in that episode is when we find out more about that character. I, I'll make a guess. Uh, I have no idea. This is just my guess. Um, but we uh, definitely I need to get some answers. I just so want what? the land to be at the dinner table. I'll be just happy. Just let the land be on the dinner tables. That's all I want. But no, it's see, the fact that you paid attention to the titles, and the titles seem to very much reflect what goes on in the show, Land of Opportunity. We have the whole thing about opportunity. Then that means that, so Lorenzo, the CIs probably get found out, Sachs, the whole thing with Davis, but with um, Salim, I, you probably said it before, he just doesn't fit. He doesn't feel right. Yeah. And yeah. also, I want to bring up something else really quickly that I don't know whether or not Gary is going to even touch upon. The teacher does not feel right to me either. Mm -hmm. Now, she's not just a regular teacher. The fact that she's connected to Tate and Tate has a lot, he's been investigated because of what happened in the events of last season. Remember him getting Tariq out. So he's on their radar. Mm -hmm. So I feel that there might be a situation where they're trying to get him for, I don't know, money laundering, whatever, because he's, he's shady. We already know that. If they're trying to get him with that, and whether or not the teacher, who is qualified and everything else, she could be working 
as well with the police. Because remember, they got all cozy previous episode because he needs a wife. Mm -hmm. I just don't trust her because that thing just seemed too convenient for me. Now, granted, they haven't acted upon anything. But if, if that is the case, it's just too much convenience. And so I wonder if she is also CIing in this situation and that Celine. I just don't trust Celine. Something is with those two. I don't trust it yet. So, yeah. I agree. Go, 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 go ahead, Gary. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I do think there's something um, sneaky and suspicious about Celine. And again, you know, even Kane thought that, you know, after meeting him for like a second. So um, my theory is like, um, it, and this goes back to a theory I had in another episode, but I, th I feel like Diana and Effie are going to get closer and they're going to basically like be in control of the drug ring at, at the school together. Like I, I think both of them are going to um, kind of oversee that. Um, and then, you know, I, I feel like there's going to be a situation where Salim finds out about this and, you know, because he's the TA, he's going to be all up in their business trying to like expose them or whatever. And um, I feel like Diana actually might call on Kane to solve this problem for her because, you know, she don't want, she don't want it getting out that they, they're running a drug ring. So, and, you know. And guess what? And guess what, Gary? Guess what? Go, go this ahead. is when Kane will go to Braden and say, it is time for you to pay the debt because you owe me a, a dead body. <laughs> yeah. That would be perfect. That's perfect. Don't do it to her. Does not have any other white friends. Because <laughs> you need you need white people in your life. Because they they just they just good. They're good to have around. You got the privileged part of the situation. They can do things that you can't do. But you need more than just one. Yeah. That's yeah. what I, I feel kind of sad for Braden because he's just the errand boy because he's white at the moment. And I just need them to pick up some. What happened to the sister? Some other friends? There's no other white people at that school. You didn't make no friends with no other white people your entire life. So to oh. y'all, yeah, they need some more white people friends. Poor uh, Braden. Bra Braden. The, the... Oh, now carry on. Finish. Finish what you say. No, I was just gonna just simply say he's just basically there because he's white. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. and. And I think Braden, he he's paying for all of the, the black token characters we've seen over the past 50 years or whatever. He's he's paying for that right now in this show. <laughs> so because he he's definitely the token white boy in this show. Like any anything that requires a white boy, Braden's there. <laughs> but yeah, um that's what I think could happen, because like Every like everything happens for a reason in this show, and the fact that Kane went to the school and saw Salim and like kind of uh, suspected him that fast, I feel like that's that situation is going to be called back on at a later time, and I feel like you know uh, it's it's totally totally plausible because we've seen Diana and Effie interact. They kind of put aside their previous issues over Tariq, and we know that. Diana is now selling stuff for Lorenzo. So it would make sense that the both of them team up since they're basically at the same place, in the same school, same class, everything. Um, so I think the two of them will kind of combine forces and Celine will be onto them. So go ahead, Dana. And just overall, I don't want to see women fight. So I like them <laughs> if, they if they team up. And this doesn't mean to be like some super crazed drug force just to team up together and to rely on each other because we know that Effie's clock is, is her time is running out soon because Tariq is going to find out what happened to Lauren. Lauren mm -hmm. seems like one of them little hard-headed kids who's going to probably run off with her can of spam. So I wonder if she is going to try to escape and then that's how everything comes. They find out that Lauren is actually alive. She's getting, she's getting antsy, and I don't like her, and she's talking too much, and she's complaining too much. Now, granted, the two cans of Spam was terrible. Feed that child. 
But at the same time, I just don't like, she's given too much back talk. She's not just sitting down and letting things play out. So, yeah. Can, can I just make a two quick comments? I agree. The no. Two cams, the two cam. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> no, 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 no. I agree. The two cams of spam. That is absolutely ridiculous. You know, we're in it. We're in a time where you can order Uber. You mean to tell me that Jenny doesn't have a Uber Eats account? And I say that because I do drive from time to time, do that stuff. So she can't have something delivered, leave at the door, leave food at the door. I mean, come on now. That's so that's kind of ridiculous. But it is what it is. And the other comment I was going to make to Gary, I like the theory of Effie and um, Diana having a bit of a team up because they are selling products at, you know, at the school. But I will say that is going to be complicated now if they if Jenny actually gets someone to investigate that rooftop, because then that could be a whole situation of because, you know, they had that conversation. Effie and uh, Diana, I mean, yeah, Effie and Diana had that conversation about Effie saying, you know, because Diana felt a certain type of way because Tariq is now with Effie and they had that conversation. And of course, they squashed they squashed everything. Right. But by the fact that somebody is now going to be investigating that rooftop, that can put one or the other in trouble. The, and, and again, they're looking for Diana. Right. So if they see Effie, that right there is is, is a bad situation. So that's why I say. That could happen too, but I do like your idea of the team up a little bit better than that happening. But that there's gonna be some drama that happened too before that it gets to that to that point. So we'll see. We're but forgetting the big main thing here. Chang knows basically everything, and he also knows. This is why I was so angry at Effie. Effie was like, "Oh, I really have." To. She let it known how much she cares about Tariq. Oh yeah. Chang could use that against her, or against Tariq, or against anybody. That's why I'm like, you don't say your feelings out loud. And she's all smiling in the bed. I really like him. So Kane could be one of those factors that we're not paying attention to. Mm -hmm. I agree. I don't, I don't like it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and I have an even bigger theory about where all of this might be going as well, like based on that, because I feel like, um, so obviously we know that, uh oh Everything I'm okay? Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, as long as I'm you're fine. okay. Keep going. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So. So yeah, with that theory in mind, so Dana and F, uh, Dana, Diana and Effie teaming up, you know, um, and we know that Diana kind of has that bond with Kane, her brother already. So what I feel like might happen is. To when once Tariq learns about Lauren and the fact that Effie and Brayden were involved in that, you know, um, that might cause him to turn on on Effie a little bit, and this might cause the the whole team to split into factions once that happens. And I, I think you could, like you know if we uh, consider the fact that Diana might might have a fallout with Monet. Um, and Tariq might have a fallout with Effie and uh, potentially Brayden also. So I feel I feel like things will kind of split into two factions and we'll have like Effie, Diana, and Kane on one side and possibly Tariq, Monet. And um, and I don't know if he'll be able to, to fix his uh, issues with Brayden, but like Brayden, you know, could be a possibility on his side because they are close and then also I think that he'll he'll turn Lauren away from the investigation and he'll end up being with her. So by the end of the season, we might see like the whole group kind of split into factions and, and then Lorenzo will be dead probably. Um, yeah. So uh, that will cause Kane and Diana to possibly not uh, be uh, friendly with uh, Monet. And then Drew, I don't know. He he does uh, he does what Drew does. I don't know. <laughs> he's gonna be with, with the Castillo guy. You know, he's gonna be. Oh, with no, him. I he's know. Gonna well, 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 he's gonna well, be on Grinder. Well, hold on. Let, let me just make a quick comment right here. Uh, I don't think that character is gonna survive. Uh, Gordo <laughs> is is the character's name. That character probably will get killed at some point because this guy was the one that was supposed to be there when they did the gun deal, and you know he did shoot at the other guy and killed the other guy that was with him. So I don't know if that character is going to survive and we'll see how that goes. I don't know if you were going to ask a question about that, Gary, but I do want to say if something happens to that Gordo character, 
then their family, the rest of them brothers, they will retaliate because they're going to blame, uh, yeah. you know, the Tejadas for getting involved and think they have something to do with that because we already know that they killed their father anyway. So, right. We'll go, yeah, go, go ahead, ahead Dana. What was um, Kane looking for when he went back in that dumpster? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I thought they were trying to make sure the guy was dead, but uh, clearly that yeah. guy got away. That CI got away. So um, I don't know what he was looking for. Yeah, I guess he was just looking for more information on them or just anything, any evidence or anything he can find. So. In the dark. I don't know. He, he could have been looking for something deeper. You think he was he was looking for something specific? Maybe he was looking because to remember he, he went back. It was like bang, 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 we're shooting. And he yeah. said to his daddy, he said to Lorenzo, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. And Lorenzo was like, What's going on? Because everybody got, you know, you got you didn't yeah. shoot at. So, so he so went me... and he walked, ran past the car and then ran to the dumpster, opened the dumpster, and clearly whatever it was he was looking for was not in the dumpster because he made that face. And then he ran back and got into the car. Yeah, because I, I thought he was just looking for the guy, like that go away or whatever. See, see, what what I think is, <laughs> that he was looking, you know, they 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 killed most of the guys, right? So they were probably looking to get get them weapons back and say, hey, we already got their money. Now we can try to resell whatever weapons are left over to a, another because another distributor because they made that comment when he was in the car with, with Lorenzo talking about, we have the guns, we have guns, yeah, we'll try yeah, to yeah. get some more money. So that's what I figured he was looking for. But we know that that CI is working mm -hmm. with the uh, with the others. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that uh, the people who comment on the show are going to leave a comment because they may, they might have, they might understand or have a better idea of what it was that he was looking for. But um, I don't know. Sure. They could have just been the guns because because they did get the guns back. So I don't know. But go ahead, Dana. That was it. That was it. Um, because I was okay. just slightly confused about that. You only had a shootout, and then you was like, "Oh, the guns," and then I was like, "Yeah." Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> All right. That was that was uh we spent a lot of time on that, and that actually covered two uh questions that I had there. So, uh, let's. Keep it moving. Um, so we saw Sax, your boy Sax is still doing slimy backstabby things. Um, it's hard to tell sometimes whose side he's on. But um he took he took that picture of uh of uh Jenny's phone and it, I, I believe Lauren was calling, so he's got a picture now of Lauren's number. So what do you guys think he might do with that information? Like because he could, you know, there's various things he could do now. He could give that to to Davis McLean. I don't know if he's going to be on his side. I don't know if he's on his side or not, really. Um, he could try to call the number himself. Like, you know, maybe something will happen where uh, he gets a bit jealous because Jenny isn't spending time with him. And he's like, oh, let me call this number. And then Lauren <laughs> picks up. <laughs> you know, something like that could happen. Um or you know he could just end up showing the wrong person that number. I don't know. What would you think might happen now that he took that picture of Jenny's phone? So I'll go to you first, Rich. Uh, I think he is going to call the number. I mean, obviously we saw him make the phone call on uh, when he called Davis's when he used Davis's burner and ended up calling Monet. I don't know if he will be too scared, but he definitely, I think he at some point is going to have to call that number to find out what is going on, who is this other person. Because you saw that they, he really emphasized to Jenny, after he found out about Blanca, he said, so is there any other secrets that you haven't told us? She said no. And that was at the same time she was getting another call from Lauren. So I kind of feel like um, he's going to probably call the number and he that's how, that's how he is going to find out. Because it feels to me like Sack's main role this season is to get all the dirt on all on all the other characters and then try to, to try to use it as leverage later when he figures out who he's who who he's going to ultimately side with. It feels that way to me based on what we've seen so far, but I have no idea what direction he's going to actually go in yet. Um but yeah, I think he's definitely going to make it he's going to call it. He's going to find out oh, so Lauren so Lauren is alive. Why are you holding this information from me? And then they're going to have to get into that whole thing with him and Jenny back and forth. Yeah. And, and even if, well, 
yeah, I, I do think he is going to call the number. And like, so what could happen is maybe he calls the number and Lauren answers. And I don't know if he'll actually recognize her voice, but maybe like the fact that now um, he has seen uh, that Blanca is involved. So like maybe he'll call on 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 them to maybe he'll call on her i mean to like help get an id or something ask her for a favor as a long time cop cop buddy or something and be like oh can you id this number or find out where it is or something like that and uh maybe he can trace it through that way because i don't does, does blanca know blanca doesn't know about lauren right I don't think she knows so they, they she she doesn't know but they were asking that question when they had their mm -hmm. board when they were going over all the possibilities, the murders and stuff, and then she said, oh, what about this person? And so we don't need to investigate that. Jenny purposely ve veered them off the path of talking about that for now. So right. that actually, you know what you say, Gary, that actually is a good theory that, because we know that Blanca and Sachs do not work together. They don't like each other. Yeah. So that'll be interesting if uh, he did give her that number and she found out, wait a second, this Jenny person is somebody, uh, she lied to both of us. But, yeah, uh, I don't. I don't know if they're going to go down that path though, but because uh, the characters don't like each other at all, so. But we'll yeah, at, at at the moment they don't like each other, but I feel like things can change uh, very quickly in this show. So yeah. you know, and if they both end up kind of suspecting Jenny or something, then you know they might end up meeting up to talk about it or something, and then you know things develop that way. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, very interesting. Um, Dana, what do you think Sax is going to do? with that number. So everyone on the show seems to have that one weakness. And for Sachs, he's just too nosy. Kind of what Whitman had, but Whitman was like obsessed. Carrie was his weakness, as it was it point blank. But with Sachs, he's nosy. Um, and so I do believe he's gonna just straight up call the number. And I also wanna say one thing, this is the worst witness protection I have ever seen. Because whatever Tasha has going on is far superior than what they gave to Lauren. Just awful. Um, look, she has only the two cans of spam. Nobody is feeding this child. And she has only two bodyguards that look like outside of the house. So that to me already makes it suspicious. Why are these big men always standing in the front of the house? Um, you know, and it seems like she has a direct line to um, what is that child name? Jen. Like there's no other chain of command. It's just her and Jen and then some two people standing outside. Terrible what they are doing to this girl. But I still believe that they that she is going to end up calling the number, which is weird because she said she doesn't have a phone. So this is what I slightly don't understand. Remember she said, oh, I don't have a phone. You left me in this house. Who, who, who is she calling from? Whose phone is she using unless I miss that? It, it, it maybe that's the phone that that she's using at at, at the house to make that phone call. So then she, this is what I mean by I just don't like the setup of this house. From <laughs> I don't know anything about witness protection, so I could be just saying things just to be saying things. But to me, it would seem that you would need someone who is in the house with you, and if there is some form of chain of command, so that people don't easily find you. So if you're using the house phone which is basically the landline phone, and it's only one number, then that makes it so easy. He's going to just call the number. Lauren, clearly, because there's no go-to person to answer phones, is going to pick up the phone, and he's, he's going to be like, hello? And then he's going to be like, Lauren? All shocked. And she's going to be like, oh, and then hang up. So this whole this setup is just not that smart. You know, I don't like that. Yeah. Now, 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 now that you brought that up, uh, I'm I'm very curious to see if he makes the phone call or he finds out this is from another location and he actually goes there in person because that would be very nobody's guarding it. Really? Yeah, I mean that, that. I mean that that would be a very uh. You know, at that point, what is Jenny going to say then when he sees Lauren and you know that she's alive? That's that'd be kind of crazy, but I don't know if they're going to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't do know, that. but. He, no, that I was just gonna say they could do that, but carry on. No, no, they can do either one because there's no security. There's no chain of command. This is just we stuck you in the house and that's the and they're not even feeding the poor child. It's spam. 
But the point that I'm just simply saying, yeah. I'll, I'll make a comment after you C continue. <laughs> no, that was just basically it. That's what I wanted to say is that he, Sachs is that nosy person, but he's that kind of nosy person where he probably has to do things himself because he she, she keeps gnawing at him. Just like he called um, the burner phone, which belonged to um, Monet, he's going to just start calling the number and that'll be that. And then that's how I feel he'll end up finding out because it would just be too much of let me go and ask my other friend to, you know, do the reverse phone number lookup of this instead of just doing it directly. And I don't think it's because it's some other man. It's because he genuinely knows Jen is keeping secrets from him. So he's going to just be nosy and find out what's going on. So, yeah, well, Lauren's going to be found out soon. Well, Sax is an investigator this season, so he needs to investigate what's happening with Jenny. So I'm I'm all for that. The only comment I was going to make is uh, I know that Lauren says she has no Wi-Fi. You know, she has spam. <laughs> but looking at the actress, how she looked in this episode with the makeup and everything, she looks perfectly fine. She doesn't, she doesn't look like she's in any distress. So that's I just want to make a comment about that because uh, I didn't notice that. And <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Like Remember, she 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 drowned. She died. Yep. What was this months ago, man? Yeah, yeah. Several months ago, her nails looked like she just got them done. The acrylic <laughs> is still attached. The glue is still gluing. You know yeah. when they do like yeah. the nice little manicure around the bit, the nail bed, and all that fancy <laughs> mess. Her hands are still glistening. Her hair yeah. is still nice and straight and coiffed. Who is doing her hands? Who is doing her nails? It's not the white people sitting up there. Uh, I don't see Jen so, trying to run a flat iron through it, her hair. It's priorities. Like Je Jenny, like it's priorities. She she made sure she had a stylist. You know, she doesn't have Netflix. <laughs> she doesn't have food, but she has to look good. You know, she has she has to look good as a witness. You know, so. Well, uh, well, I you know. Well, I'll just say that that's like a a, a mini critique uh, because we already know that they really <laughs> emphasize style on the show. You know, Tariq had on a lot of suits in this episode that look really sharp. So I, I get it. This is about the style, the status, but I'm just saying somebody being held there or, you know, having to stay there. I, I didn't feel as though she was in, in any real harm, like she's really worried about being there because she didn't look like she was worried. Just talking about, I, I don't have my social media. I don't have my Wi-Fi. I don't have a cell phone and I only have spam that I thought that, come on now, that's like a, that's not a serious issue there. But I just want to make that observation because I don't know if anyone else is going to actually say something about that. But yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, and it, it it stuck out. It stuck out because she looks really good. Her skin is glowing, her hair yeah. is flowing, her nails are like sharp. So it's just certain things. It's like, oh, do, are they going to the store to get your, your hair products? Because it looked like wherever she's at, you're not getting no no shea butter. There's no cocoa butter where, where you at. Man, so you, I'm just you, wondering you, what's going on. You know they don't know how how what products to buy for us, man. So yeah. you can't, you can't, you can't trust, you can't trust them to do our shopping, man. Like, <laughs> so is she allowed to go into the store to get the shea butter products? Because I'm just wondering. She looked like she uses the black soap. You know, the incense be good. She looked like she smelled good. So I'm just concerned. Where where are we getting the product from? Good question. <laughs> yeah, man, they they don't know about that cocoa bar. Yeah. <laughs> Now. But um, yeah. So what? Well, another question I have, right? We are at episode four right now, and we have not seen Noma since I believe the first episode. Do you feel like it's it's starting to get a bit weird that like the main kind of you know uh, antagonist like is kind of been missing for a while? I know she's busy doing other things. But you know, will, will, we, will, will we may, maybe see a return in the next episode or something? You know, uh, well, what do you guys think? Go ahead. Well, Gary, this is at, now in this part of the show. This is where I have to put you on the spot because this is your fellow uh, native person living in the UK. So maybe you know where she's at because I don't know where the hell the character is at. <laughs> well, I mean, the jet the jet lag is crazy. I have to say, like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a six hour flight from London to New York. You know, like, and then there's the jet lag, the time difference. So she could be, you know, at the hotel sleeping, catching up on her sleep or something. Maybe. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> well, 
Well, let me, let me just say this. I mean, I, I, I did see the brief trailer for next week. I, I see that uh, it looks as though Tariq, uh, Braden, and Effie take an international trip. I don't know if she's had, if she has anything to do with that international trip, so maybe we'll see her in the next episode. But I do agree it would be great to know more about what's happening with the character. They did explain that she was away on business. I get that. But uh, we're almost at episode five, so I hope this, we are going to see her again at some point. Because we I did see some people you know, leaving comments asking, where is the character at? So we're not the only ones asking this question. <laughs> Wait, is, is Effie in this international trip? I didn't see the trailer. Yeah, yeah. It, it looks like they take a trip somewhere and they get into some trouble. Like Braden is in trouble see, in the trailer. So. This is yeah. what I wonder. Effie just complained about how broke she was. Passports are expensive. When did she get her passport? Uh, I can answer that question. Uh, the power writing team, because they made made it happen as quick as possible. It was but an I guess we'll get an answer passport. next week. Yes, they, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll get an answer next week. But it'll probably be a very quick solution to that. But you <laughs> see, the fact that they're going international, this makes me even more excited. Give me my back door. UK spinoff. Yeah. You're literally yeah. leaving the States. Just give me my spinoff. Just make me happy. I Gary agree. can be in it. Oh, yeah. Please do. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send a, a link to my agent and you, uh, the stars team can book me, <laughs> you know, for Power London. But um, I, I do think we'll, we'll see it next week because I did see the trailer and um, like, the part where like Tariq is like at a restaurant or something like an outdoor restaurant. If you go back to, I believe it's the main season trailer. Um, Noma is in that location too. I think in in that I think okay. it's that same yeah. location. So yeah. I that think she sense. is going to be there. Um, and uh, also like you know with the passports, I feel like she's the only one that can make something happen that quickly to where like oh. You need you need a passport. Okay, we'll we'll get our forging team on the case to to get you a new passport. You know, so she can probably make it happen that quick. Um, yeah, yeah. So that, it, yeah, go ahead. That that one hundred percent makes sense, Gary. So uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see next week uh, how that little situation pans out. But yeah, I, I do. I think we definitely need to see the character because we haven't seen the character for quite a while, and I understand. That it, you know, it, it does say something when the character shows up, then it's going to be a very big deal. So I understand why they don't want to have her on every episode, but uh, it would be good to get an update as to what's happening with her. Because again, it, it feels like, uh, you know, I know you are the OB stunt double. It feels like he is the main person that they deal with on this show now. So uh, I, we definitely need to see what's, what's happening with her, I would say. Yeah, definitely. And, um, I think it's smart as well to kind of uh, not have her be on, on every episode and oversaturate her. Uh, number one, because there's so many storylines going on with the characters that like the, the common characters of the show. So it would just be even more convoluted if she was always there. Um, and number two, like it, it does help them set up things for the future. Um, so, you know, maybe once some of these other uh, storylines, like, you know, stabilize, then she can be in the show more. But then also the fact that she's away, it means that she's doing other things. And these other things could could be a part of the spinoff that they they want to lead towards if they do do the London thing. So maybe, you know, once they get to that London spinoff, we'll start to see some of these other things that she's involved in. Um, you know, if she is a main character in that show, you know, I'm just, I'm just assuming at this point, but, um, I agree. yeah, so it is kind of smart, but yeah, but at the same time, it would be cool to see her because she was such a cool, mysterious character, but that's why it's also good that they, uh, gave her a number two with Obi because he can be the representation of, you know, Noma and just kind of boss them around and give them orders um and you know if 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 everything kind of comes to uh a face-off or you know some sort of um conflict between Tariq and Noma like Obi could be the character maybe that gets killed off first before they get to Noma like you know so that's possible well I think I think they I think they have definitely foreshadowed that that will happen since their character is very adamant that he he wants to kill Tariq so <laughs> yeah, 
exactly. Uh, Dana, everything okay? Okay, there she is. I don't know. Can you hear us, Dana? We're having some technical difficulties here, so bear with us. It's, but, like, you yeah. said, it's like you said, Gary, uh, Lorenzo's f f fingerprints are everywhere. <laughs> 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 yeah, Lorenzo's fingerprints. Uh, can you hear us at all, Dana? Uh, the camera doesn't seem to be One working, second. but I don't know if she. Okay, but yeah, like um, we were basically just talking about Noma, and you know about the fact that with her being off screen, like she's probably doing things that are going to set up like the, uh, the spinoff if they decide to go in that direction of her being the main character in the spinoff. Like some of these things that she's away doing could probably be things that they show in, in the spinoff later on. And then also, um, I, right before you got back, I was saying that it's good that they have Obi as the number two because that you know it, let's assume that there's going to be conflict between Tariq and Kane and and like you know uh with with regards to Noma because we know that Monet actually doesn't want them to be selling stuff for Noma so that is going to cause some conflict later so if if it does get to the point where everyone is at odds and they want to kind of um you know branch away or, or kill the connect or whatever to be independent again uh, maybe it will be Obi that they actually end up taking out and Noma will kind of still be around, you know, uh, um, as a long-term kind of character. Uh, but so but go ahead, I, Dana. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, go, let's go to Dana because I think I know what she's going to say. But go, go ahead, Dana. <laughs> Obi lives. I will fight everybody if they try to come for Obi. Obi lives. You can kill Noma, Momo, whatever her name is. But Obi lives. He is the connective thread between my UK spinoff and this show. Um, I feel that he is acting upon Monet. And so if you're really like, I don't like, I don't want to work for Monet. I don't like that Monet. What is that child name? Noma. Noma. Forgive me. He is the one who is acting for Noma. Everything that she says, he is the consigliere. As they, I love that word, consigliere. But anyway, he's the consigliere of the whole situation. And therefore, and if you really want to get to the root of the problem and you want to stop, you know, basically being Monet's errand boy, you have to kill Air, you have to kill Monet. He has no stake in the game in terms of this. He works for Monet. He wants you to fail either way, but he's not going to set it up where you purposely fail. No, he said, I'm surprised you made it even this far. I think he gets a little joy and a kick out of it. Maybe he's secretly rooting for them. To see what they can pull off. Uh, that gun thing was the whole next step. Yes. I agree. Yeah, the gun was the next step. I I, I just was gonna say, yeah, I the end game here is Noma versus Monet. And I don't know if we're gonna get that at the end of the season. But that obviously, because of all the stuff that happened with Mecca, his past, this is the final showdown you're going to see with those two characters at some point. That's the end game with this whole thing. That's my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And, and that's, I think, go ahead, go ahead, Dana. No, no. Who is the connective thread to this situation? It's Lorenzo. Because if you look at it, Lorenzo killed Mecca, which was both for the love of the both people's lives, right? You have Monet and you had um, Noma. And even though Dante was doing both of them dirty and I don't know what the whole situation was, playing them both at the same time. Well, we decided he wanted to be, you know, a, what a polygamist. I'm not sure what the word is, but fine. But the connective threat is the fact that Lorenzo killed the love of their lives. So uh, I- That was Monet. Monet killed Monet. That was, that that was, was Monet. My, that was my, no, yeah, that was. <laughs> I'm old. Yeah, Monet. Yeah, Monet, Mo Monet, 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 Monet killed right now. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. He killed Mecca, and I'm confusing the whole thing with Zeke. Forgive I said anything. I'm old, but <laughs> Monet gotta go. See, she gotta go doubly. Yeah. Boom. Monet or no more? 
see, here's the thing. If we're trying to do a spinoff, then it would have to be Monet. Because in that way, they're all free and we can go off and do our own thing. Right? But if we don't get the spinoff, then it has to be Noma so we can move past this big bad villain who has us in a chokehold. Yeah. My, now, see, it my depends whole thing on, is, yeah. I, I think they want, it seems to me like they want this character to be there for a long time and, and hence them kind of like not having her be in, in every episode. So I think eventually, yes, Noma might get taken out. But um, I feel like since Obi is the one that's always there, I, I just feel like he is going to be like the first one in the line of fire when things go south. So, so uh, let me just make a quick comment, then you can go back to go back to Dana. Uh, I think, you know, if you really want to sell me on Tariq being the next ghost, being a cold-blooded killer, you need to have him turn on Monet. Because remember at the beginning of the season, when Monet had that conversation with Tariq, hey, if you know anything, you'll let me know. You'll help me. Yes. Well, Tariq has the upper hand because he already knows that Monet killed Mecca. And Noma, I'm pretty sure Noma wants to know who killed Mecca, right? So it will be really cold-blooded if at the end of the season, he tells Noma this information and she kills Monet. Then he aligns himself with her and what she's doing. I think that would be an excellent way to do that. I don't think they're going to do that because, again, they like Mary J. Blige, what she brings to the show. But uh, I just want to see how they get to that point, because at some point, those two characters, Monet and and, and Noma, they're going to have to have a showdown. So I want to see how they get to that, because that's going to be pretty interesting to see what the end result of all that is. But continue. Oh, the, thing, the thing is that what my question is, what else, as a writing standpoint, what else does the character bring to the show? I think Monet has given all that she can give for this whole thing. There is nothing else she can do anymore at this point. As opposed to Noma, who offers us a world of, oper literally a world, international world of opportunities where this show can explore and grow. And I feel that in order to separate yourself from power power, because this is now power ghost, you have to expand your horizons. Now, even if you look at what they're doing with the whole thing with guns, now we don't deal with guns, it's usually drugs. That's getting our toes wet in another, another skill set. We're learning a different skill set than what we had in previously, right? So I feel that in order for this whole thing to grow, and Monet offers that open door of opportunities, and so does Obi, whatever his name is. He offers that world of opportunities through uh, Noma. She has to live, as opposed to what else is Monet bringing to the table, aside from more stress and drama in the dancery. So to me, it, it, just, it makes more sense for it to be Noma, to, to be the one who lives. It's going to just be a, a cyclical thing. And it's, you know, the game is going to not be able to expand as much as it could be with Noma. Y'all still corner boys, not corner, but essentially still corner boys as opposed to international. Oh, well, that's just what I think. Even though Tariq doesn't want international, him and technically him and Effie, they want to have their nice little happiness away from this whole situation. But we all know that that's not going to happen. I don't feel that that's going to happen. They're not going to get their happy ending in that terms. Or else what is power? Nothing. Power is you and I on the street, hoping that, you know, we'll make it one day in the corporate office. But that's not really what power stands for. And in this terms, it's much higher than that. So that's why I say Monet has to go. She, Her character offers us nothing else. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, it will be interesting to see, you know, because I, I assume she will kill Lorenzo. So it will, it will be interesting to see what direction they, they take the character in after that. I mean, I guess the Noma thing will be next if she does. 
get rid of them. I mean, we we see there's a funeral in the trailer, so I, I'm thinking it's got to be Lorenzo. So, yeah, I assume that Monet will take him out possibly in the next episode, and then I I really do want to see what's next for her. And um, I don't know, like maybe what you said, Dana, might come true, and and maybe Monet's days will be numbered by the end of the season. But, but we'll, in that we'll same trailer, we saw a funeral, but we also saw a shootout. Oh, yeah, in that course. same trailer. So, double homicide. <laughs> the streets get all the bodies. <laughs> that would be interesting. A, a death at a funeral. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I can't wait to see what, what the people think of that one. Um, you know, I'm sure there'll be some comments about Monet, you know, about her, if, she, if she'll ever get taken out or if Noma will. So uh, definitely let us know what you guys think of that. But um, yeah, so before we uh, wrap up, is there anything else that you want to say about uh, the show or even like the trailer? You know, if you if you saw it, you know, um, let us know now. So I'll go to you first, Dana. Was there anything else in your notes that you wanted to mention? I, I hold, on, hold on now. I got to pull out my notes and everything. Um, let's you want see. me to come back um, to you? Well, Yes, you can come back to me. All right, go ahead, uh, Rich. You can go first. Any final final thoughts? Uh, no, final thoughts. I thought it was an excellent episode. Uh, looking forward to seeing what happens next week. By, by the way, the, the title of next week's episode is No More Second Chances. So I would expect something bad to happen to somebody in that episode. That's why I say if Lorenzo gets taken out, hey, it, it is what it is. But uh, we did see in the trailer that it looks like Tariq is being held at gunpoint. Looks like Braden is getting beat down as well. So there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen. Now, I don't know what Braden does that uh, causes them to get in trouble when they go uh, you know, overseas or wherever. But uh, I look forward to it. But yeah, we're definitely looking forward to next week's episode for sure. So in oh, regards to what, what I wanted to say really, oh, sorry, was I over talking? No, go ahead. Okay, so like in regards to certain things, I wanted to say that, you know, Diana, not Diana, uh, Lauren is at the part where she's like, I hate them. And so I wonder, again, is she going to start doing something irrational? Because she has all of that anger and all of those emotions, and she's stuck in a house with no one to talk to, and no outlet, no TV, no nothing. So I'm starting to wonder if she's going to start acting stupid again, more than before. So dimension to stupidity. Um, and therefore, she is either going to get them more in trouble. Because remember, uh, Jen was like, oh, do you have anything else? Do you have anything else? Look at these photos. They're out there happy, living their best lives. And you're stuck in here with me and spam. So that's what I wonder if she's going to start acting reckless. Is she going to is she going to be like start saying anything that she can to get out of the house, to give them more information? Is she going to hurt the case? or help the case. And again, also I do think there's gonna be a prison break. She's gonna break out of there. Because it, it, it's like, what is the point of them just constantly showing us her stuck in this house? There has to be a moment where she does something. Because why even bring the character back at this point? Um, so that right there is really interesting. And then on top of that, I wanted to bring out Whitman. Whitman got himself his own self killed. Um, he was basically his own downfall, which would go again with that greed situation. Um, and again, I don't understand why he was so upset. Like, I, I, Carrie must have had some kind of magical power over him because make sure you find somebody in your life that goes as hard as Whitman does for, for Carrie. That's all I'm saying. I don't know if it's love, lust, voodoo, but find somebody who goes as hard. Begin because that was just crazy, and also just to be that stupid of breaking. It's not like you know we're gonna go in and send the guys. It's literally breaking and entering that they did. So that right there was just fascinating to how his own downfall was basically his rush and his need to put her behind bars and avenge Carrie who I'm pretty sure never thought about him and still isn't thinking about him. Even from day one, he was obsessed. Because remember, when she popped up on the screen, she was like, a jail. He was just 
that was crazy right there. So but that was one of the things that I wanted to say. And then um, kind of on top of that, the whole car situation, what many people, I don't want them to forget is this. So Tariq got the Porsche, right? But he then said, said a line of this, went from BMW to Porsche. When did he get a BMW? That line bothered me. Well, did he always have a car? And then that was just a joke on us that we never knew or paid attention. And he was yeah, perfectly it was a just joke. walking everywhere. Oh, okay. Because then I was he, like, he what? Said, what? Um, he said the BMW stands for a black man walking. So <laughs> I missed that whole part. That was hilarious. See, that should have been my name instead of Lorenzo Fingerprint. Black man walking. So that was smart. Also, also he's stupid because the Porsche. You see what Effie is doing, and she had that broke down car that nobody paid attention to. Yes, she's poor, but she's also smart with being poor. Nobody's looking for that car. That car got one wheel on it, and that's it. But you come to school with a Porsche. Now, granted, you're in an Ivy League, and you're all with the hooties and the, and the snooty people, and they have their Porsches and their BMWs as well. But also another thing that's just magically interesting to me, why would you take that lovely blue, but that blue stands out too much. That's the fur coat of Frank Lucas. So I'm just, again, really, what are you doing with your life? Maybe that is to show how, like, idiotic that he is young. So kids do idiotic things. Like, they want the best and the brightest that stands out the most. So maybe that is what it is. But I do feel that that car, it maybe ends up being his downfall or found out more or something to do with the investigation. Because you're driving that all around town. And in New York City... That stands out in general, believe it or not. It does stand out. You're going to get somebody looking, even if it's for two seconds. So that was just insane to me. And you're still living like off campus, but it's close to the dorm and you're a college kid. But we all know you have inheritance, but it's not like you have, you know, oil money inheritance. So I don't like the fact that he did that. And I liked him walking. Walking is very convenient. Ain't nothing wrong with your legs. You get good exercise and you get to go wherever you need to go. You don't have to stop in front of the light for anything. So, yeah, um, that was just weird. And I think they did that because everybody, the audience himself, keeps joking that he doesn't have a car. But he lives in New York City. There's no reason for a car. So that's kind of the only two things that I really wanted to bring up was that. And also, I hope that RSV or RS, RSJ, sorry, RSJ, um, he ends up being a little kind of connective thread. You know how you have like a Mr. Feeney of the show? You know Mr. Feeney, Richard, from Boy Meets World, and he dropped that little, little thing of wisdom on you? He could be the Mr. Feeney of the whole thing. He just gives Tariq little drops of wisdom, and then that's it. So, yeah, so that's everything. That's good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's hilarious. Um, no, my my final thoughts. The only thing is, um, like I noticed in the trailer, there's that, you know, and and obviously sometimes they like to play tricks in the trailer, like it, things might not be as it seems and stuff. But I, I saw there was a a shot where like a knife came out, and I don't know if that was part of the same scene where uh, Lorenzo's li lifting up the car bonnet or something like that. So yeah, I, I, my prediction is Lorenzo's dead in the next episode. Like that, that's my official prediction for, for episode five. Like, so. Well, yeah. Well, 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 one final thing I will say, Gary, is Lorenzo did have on that blue shirt that we saw when they had that trailer they released a couple of weeks when he got into the fight with Monet. So yeah, there's probably a very good guess that something happened to him in the next episode. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh I think that's gonna happen for sure. Uh, um I can't wait to see what the people think. And um yeah, before we get out of here, I, I, we, we can do a quick round of shout outs. Um I just wanted to shout out some people real quick. So shouts to uh DJ United because he reached out to to me on Twitter, said he you know enjoys listening to the show and everything. Um he's even interested in talking power with us at some point. Um, but yeah, shouts to him because he showed a lot of love, and uh, we also like kind of got into a discussion about power a little bit. Um, and you know, he also has a, a channel I noticed about you know UK football and stuff. Like, so 
yeah, uh, shouts to him. And then also big shouts to Raiwan, who has been commenting on, you know, both the Snowfall and Power recaps. Big shouts to Inga71, you know, a big supporter. Shouts to Jeremiah Lutumba, uh, uh, Digital Al Align uh, or something. So, sorry if I, you know, didn't say your name correctly. And shouts to Motown Investor, Rainy J, Tracy Lee, Eric Milligan, and yeah, just everyone who supports the show and leaves comments on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, a lot of you are commenting on more than one of our videos. Like, like you don't just comment on power. You also comment on the Snowfall and the entertainment, you know, uh, channel and the BMF shows and everything. So a lot of people are supporting. So thank you all. I appreciate you. Um, so, Rich, do you have uh, any shout outs before we get out of here? Yeah, I want to give a shout out to all the same people that you mentioned. I uh, appreciate them continuing to comment. I do definitely, though, I want to say, yeah, I do definitely want to give a shout out to, of course, Inga71. And I want to give a shout out to Tracy Lee because she had a comment last week that had me rolling where she said that she she thinks of Tate. She compares Tate, Tate to the Grinch and the fact that he, you know, all the stuff with the Grinch, you know, if you know about that story about him uh, not having a heart, then all of a sudden he has a heart. I thought that was a very funny comment. That's this is very, very, very on point comment. So, but yeah, we we always enjoy looking uh, looking at you guys' comments. So, thank you for the continued support. We look forward to seeing what you say about this episode. And how about you, Dana? Uh, yes. No. Oh, same thing as well. Thank you so much for listening to us um, and commenting every week so it's it's really fun to interact with all of you guys so thank you so much indeed and that is going to be it for us this week we will be back next week to cover uh power book two season three episode five so look out for that next week and until then take care of yourselves everyone have a nice easter break I know it's a it's a pretty long one here in the UK. Like I think there's uh we're getting like uh Monday and Tuesday off as well, as well as Sunday. So yeah, it's a bit of a long one. Um, but yeah, enjoy the break and everyone, you know, stay healthy and we'll see you next week. Peace out.